This week, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome ashore my 1,000th castaway since I devised this series back in 1942, and it's Field Marshal Montgomery of Alamein. Field Marshal, is music an interest of yours? Well, it is now, because I'm what I might call in the evening of life, and uh, it, it hasn't always been. What was your overall plan in choosing just eight records to take with you for an indefinite period of solitude? Are you looking back? Well, in, in, a, in a sense, but I'm... Uh, I chose, first of all, the first one, the Battle Hymn of the Republic, because I'm a soldier, and the last one, Over the Wings of a Dove, because I thought I might be able to fly away from this island. <laughs> and then, then, in between, I filled in uh, two to, to seven with, with songs and tunes I'm really very fond of indeed and, and like to listen to. And that's how I did it. Well, let's start with the Battle Hymn of the Republic. The Battle Hymn of the Republic, sung by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. What's your second choice? Second choice is My Love is Like a Red, Red Rose, which is a Scottish uh, love song, and I think one of the nicest I've ever heard, and it's sung by, by Kenneth uh, McKellar, and I'm very fond of it indeed. Kenneth McKellar. Field Marshal, your childhood by modern standards was very Spartan and very disciplined, wasn't it? Yes, it was, and, uh, <clears throat> of course, my mother ran the whole house. My father was a saint. If any saints do walk about on this earth, I worshipped him. My mother was a disciplinarian. She was married when she was 16, and she had her 17th birthday on her honeymoon. And, of course, the children began to appear, and she was the wife of a very busy London vicar, and shortly after was the wife of a bishop. Yes. And you, there was no time to attend to the children. Well, she didn't know how to do it because she was so young, you see. Were you a rebellious boy? I was very rebellious. And uh, when my mother demanded uh, discipline from me, I refused to, to give in. I, I said no and took my beating. Now, I can tell you a story that's an interesting one, that I was caught one day in the garden smoking. I didn't want to smoke, but I just thought I would. I was smoking a cigarette be behind a bush or something. And I was caught and taken into the house. And my father heard about this, and he took me into our little chapel, which we had in the house. And we knelt down, and he prayed to the Almighty that I might be forgiven this uh, dreadful sin. And then there was a little silence. And then I thought that the matter was settled, that the Almighty had accepted my uh, sorrow. Not at all. When we opened the door and went out, <laughs> there was my mother with a cane. She thought a more earthly correction was needed as well, and I got beaten. I took it. But I think the point is, really, that uh, when people say to me, uh, what makes you tick? I think what makes me tick was that I absolutely refused to give in when I thought I was, uh, there was no need to. For instance, my mother said to me once, Bernard, you will sign the pledge. I said, never will I sign the pledge. I don't want to drink. I don't drink. But I'm not going to sign the pledge. That was the sort of thing which, uh, which I think uh, moulded my character. I like to think it did. And it was good for me. Yes. On both sides of your family, there were churchmen, there were civil servants, traders. No military tradition at all. Why did you decide to be a soldier? Was it a, a sudden decision? Well, uh, I, I think, as far as I can remember, I wanted to be a soldier when I was quite young, about uh, five or six. And then I think it finally became uh, uh, finalised uh, when the time of the Boer War. Yes. And I saw the soldiers going off to the Boer War in their red coats, of course, in those days, and I said, that's the stuff for me. Now, that was very unpopular indeed with my family, who wanted me for the church. Mm. Um, it was always uh, assumed, because I was like my father in face, that I must, I must be a clergyman. And when I got St Paul's and they said, uh, both good in London, uh, what, what are you going to be? I said, a soldier. Yes. You had an excellent school record at St Paul's, not quite such a good one at Sandhurst. Well, my school record at St Paul's was very good on, on the game side, but on the academic side it wasn't so good. Sandhurst, no. Instead yes. of being there a year, a year and a half, and uh, finally passed out a full private. 
Which is all right. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> and then the army in India. Now, in Edwardian days, the army in India was more equipped for ceremonial duties than as a, a tough fighting force. Well, I think in those days, the army, I, I think it's really was more amateur. Mm. They, they didn't understand that, uh, that uh, war was a serious business and a life study, nor did I at I that would, time. Now, from that rather picturesque form of soldiering, you went as a young subaltern in charge of a platoon into the first battle of Ypres. Well, I went as a young subaltern in charge of a platoon in August 1914, which, which dealt with uh, Mons and Lakato, and commanded my platoon of 30 men. And uh, I went right through that war, of course. Yes. You were badly wounded. When very first... badly wounded at, uh, in the first battle of Ypres. Yes. And I was taken back to an advanced dressing station, and they thought I was dead. And there was an officer there who was dead, and they dug two graves because I was just about to die. Well, I defeated them. I didn't die, you see. <laughs> in 1939, you were back in France in command of a division. Had you any inkling yourself that all was not as well as it seemed, that the Allied equipment was wrong, that the overall tactics were wrong, that the French army was wrong? Yes, I had. Interesting point, that. Uh, I better explain it by saying that... Uh, Neville Chamberlain, who was Prime Minister, came out to uh, see the army in, uh, in the field. And uh, he came one day to have lunch with me at my divisional headquarters. This was about uh, January or, Fe or February uh, of, of that winter. 1940. Yeah. And he said, I don't think the Germans will attack, do you? And I said, well, sir, you wait. Wait till the weather gets better in the spring and there would be a frightful disaster. The French army will, will crack. The generals are too old, and the unit commanders are too old, and the politicians, the ones I know, are all second-class lawyers, and they're no good. The whole show is, is, is wrong. Mm. And, and it'll, be, it'll be a bad show. Yes, and how right you were. Well, let's break off at this point for your third record. What should we have? My third record is uh, one by Richard Tauber, uh, you are my heart's delight. Richard Tarber singing, You are my heart's delight. Now, so back to 1940, you came back to England via Dunkirk and you refitted the division. It was the only completely outfitted division there was in the country at that time, I believe. And well, there was only the equipment in England for one division. Yes. And it was given to me and I got ready to go back. To France? To France. Luckily, France... Uh, capitulated on the 17th of June. Otherwise, we should have had the same thing over again. Now, the rest of your war story is history. The Western Desert, Tunis, Sicily, yeah. Italy, the Normandy landings. You were in your 50s, and you suddenly became a national figure, and you became a character, an instantly recognisable <laughs> character, the, the unmistakable Monty with the beret with the badges on it and the flying jacket. Now, this was a morale-building project, and a, a public relations job in which you had a considerable hand, wasn't it? It was, really. Uh, I thought in those days, you see, that there was the staff and the generals were remote from the soldiers. Now, I've learned, of course, in my career that that doesn't pay, that the, the soldiers are really uh, the people who, in the end, win the battle. And you've got to be with them, you see, all the time. And they must know you. The wearing of the berry, of course, that was quite an accident. I, I had to go about finally in a tank when the battle began, not to fight from, because it wasn't my job to fight, uh, but it just, if you were blown up by a mine in a jeep, you'd lost a leg. Mm. But if you were in a tank, you didn't. And then the tank crew said one day, I think, sir, that instead of wearing your red hat, it would be much better to wear a berry, and they gave me a berry yes. with a tank or a badge in. Well, then I stuck my, my general, I was a general then, my general's badge in and had two berries. And for the rest of the war, I would. The Army Council didn't like it. No. I got ticked off. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I stuck to it. I said it's worth a couple of divisions. Of course. Because when things are bad in the battle, you go up in front. <clears throat> and if you just wear a red hat, they don't know who it is. But once they saw the, the barrier with two badges, they said, ah, there's the, there's the old boy. Must be all right. You worked, of course, very closely with Winston Churchill. How good a military tactician was he? How much practical help could he give in the map room? 
Well, one of my troubles was that Winston had once been a soldier. Now, you would have thought that might have been an advantage, but it wasn't, because his soldiering had great difficulty in getting away from uh, the early days, like the Battle of Omdurman, when he drew his snicker-snee and ch charged <laughs> the dervishes, you see. Yeah. And he didn't understand that uh, 1944, going to Normandy, was uh, a little bit different, or even fighting in the desert. Now, uh, I don't mind telling you that uh, when I was fighting the Battle of Alamein, he wanted me to attack Rommel in September. I refused because of the uh, moon. I had to have a moon for the purposes of handling the mines and things. And uh, I won't be ready, I said, by the September moon. He wanted September to synchronize with Stalingrad. He's fixed it up with Stalin, you see. Yes. And I said, no. As a commander-in-chief in the field, you are bound to have tussles with your political master. You can't help it, you see. But Winston was very good when he saw that it was no good going on with it. And when he came to stay with me in the field, which he did several times, I used to make it quite clear to him. I said, sir, you are here in the uh, zone of the armies. You must do what I tell you, because we can't afford to, you to take uh, risks, you see, and uh, I should get in awful trouble if you got bumped off by a shell or something. And he was very good, very good indeed. He agreed that in the zone of the armies, uh, I was the boss. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yes. What has been the most exultant moment in your military life? Not necessarily the greatest moment, like accepting the German surrender on Luneburg Heath, but one good, satisfying moment that you look back on with great pleasure. In the whole of my military life? Yes. Well, I should think getting ashore successfully in Normandy, with fairly small casualties, comparatively, it was a great moment. The main plan had succeeded. Yeah, the main plan had succeeded. We, I mentioned just now Luneburg Heath. You still have, I believe, that German surrender document. You hung on to it. I did, but it, uh, I've given it away. Have you? Then, uh, about a year ago, uh, uh, after my house was burgled, uh, I, I, I said, I think I'd better give this to the Imperial War Museum. Mm -hmm. And they've got it. <clears throat> Which is where it is now. Well, it's a national thing. It's, it's the original bit of paper. Yes. Let's have your fourth record, please. My fourth record is uh, Invitation to the Wars by Weber. And I chose that because it was a great favour to my wife. And you might think, of course, that I'm not the sort of person who went dancing, but actually, when I was married, I did. And she liked that very much. Invitation to the Waltz by Weber. Invitation to the Waltz, Willy Boskowski conducting the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra. A field marshal, you spent a lot of your retirement in writing. Have you another book on the stocks? No, I finished. I read a lot and I think a lot, and I'm not doing any more writing. You will live in this beautiful house in Hampshire which you converted from a mill. What are your other occupations? Do you go to the theatre? Do you watch television? Never. I never go out at night. No. Let's have record number five. Record number five okay. is a song sung by Elizabeth Swarzkopf and the title, English title, would be Don't Be Cross and I'm very, very fond of it indeed. It's the most charming thing. Don't Be Cross sung by Elizabeth Schwarzkopf. Now what's record number six? Record number six, a Welsh choir. I had in the war, of course, the Welsh division under me all the time, and they were very, very good. And when the war was over, uh, I went down to Wales to uh, see my, some of my old comrades, and it was Bevan, and Owen Bevan, whom I, I knew very well and liked immensely, who said I ought to go up to the Welsh valleys. I went to Ebervale, where I was... Uh, received by the town council, the city fathers, very kindly. And uh, when we had a talk, I said, would you mind singing to me? Because I understand you are very good at singing. And they said, certainly. And they sang the most marvelous things. It was quite off the cuff, they didn't know. So I would like a Welsh choir to, to sing to me uh, the, the hymn, All Through the Night. All Through the Night, sung by the Triochi male choir. I feel, Marshall, I don't have to ask how resourceful you'd be as a castaway, but how good are you with your hands? I'm a good gardener, because I don't uh, actually do much gardening myself now. I give orders. 
but I know how to do it. Mm-hmm. And I can grow vegetables and things. I hope there'd be something there, maybe. What about escaping? I know you're good with small craft. Could you build yourself a, a catamaran or a raft? Well, I've done a lot of yachting, of course. I'm not certain that I could build one. I should keep a jolly good lookout for, for, for passing vessels, the smoke yeah. and things like that. I think I'd have to wait until I was rescued. Yes, I have an idea we'd see you back here quite soon, somehow or other. Let's have record number seven. Record number seven is Cockles and Muscles Alive, alive O. Now, I want that, of course, because I, I really am partly Irish. Well, the Irish are great people, you know. They, uh, they like fighting. And if they can't find anyone to fight, they, they generally fight each other. They're pretty good at that, you <laughs> see. So I would like that song, Cockles and Muscles, Alive, Alive O. William Clausen singing Cockles and Muscles. Now we come to your last record. What's that? My last record is O for the Wings of a Dove. And I, I've chose that one because I have a sort of feeling that after a time, I wouldn't mind having a few wings myself to get out of this desert island when I get a bit sick of it. O for the Wings of a Dove, sung by the choir of St. John's College, Cambridge. If you could take just one of the eight records you've played us, which would it be? Oh, I think it would be uh, that song by Elizabeth Swatskoff, uh, Don't Be Cross. Very lovely song. And one luxury to take to the island with you. Well, I think I'd like a piano. You see, I'm always very sorry I didn't learn music. I hadn't time. And if I had a piano on, on there with some literature about how to learn the piano, I would have lots of spare time and I would, I would, I would learn it. Splendid. And one book, putting aside the Bible and Shakespeare, which are already on the island. Well, I'd like, it may horrify you to say so, but I would like a book which I wrote myself about war. Which one is this? A History of Warfare, in which I make it quite clear uh, that the generals, besides fighting wars, have got to play their part in preventing them. And this book really, at the end, it goes into the question of how to, how to stop fighting. And I would have lots of time and I would ponder over how we could stop people fighting. So when I came back, which I hope to do, one might be able to do something about it. Right. And thank you, Field Marshal Montgomery of Alamein, for being the 1,000th castaway on Desert Island District. Well, I'm delighted to be so, and I think it's a great honour to be the 1,000th. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone.